Well, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service here at the Ark. It's great to share this time again with you. Can you believe it's now been 14 weeks since we've been videoing our services because of the lockdown? I, I'm sure, like me, you're incredibly grateful that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. So we don't need to meet in a building to meet with him, but he's right with you wherever you are. Not only that, his word promises us and assures us that he wants to fill us with his very presence, to fill us, fill our lives with his Holy Spirit. I want to say um, happy Father's Day to you dads out there. Usually if you're a part of this church you'll know that on Father's Day at the end of the service we would hand out chocolates to uh, all the dads. And um, so we bought lots of chocolates and clearly there's no one here to share them with me apart from George and uh, and George, being an honourable man like he is, um, he isn't going to be a father for another 10 weeks or so. So, uh, so he's refusing to eat any of these out of, out of his principles. I've got through five boxes, guys. And, uh, and I just wanted to say that, you know, I'm on it and uh, I'll do my best for you. So happy Father's Day to you. If you're a member or usually meet with us here when we've been able to, you should be receiving weekly emails and telephone calls just to keep you updated with where things are at and also for us to be kept updated with how you're doing. If for any reason you haven't been receiving phone calls or indeed emails, would you give the office um, a call and just to let them know because we'd like to rectify that just to make sure we know where things are at with you. Um, in the last email that we've just sent out to you, you will notice that we've put a link in to the kind of COVID related questionnaire that we made some time back now. And um, thank you for those that filled that out. That was really useful to us. If you never did fill that out, then please click that link and go and just spend it. It's very quick to do. Just spend a few minutes just to run through those and it just updates us, make sure that we know where you're at. And also, if you've, if you've already filled it out, but your situation has changed over these weeks, then again, just resubmit that form. We'd be really grateful. If you haven't been able to come to our church or you've been watching online and you've never been here and aren't part of the membership, as it were, we would love to get to know you as well. So um, you'll see some links up here, some our Facebook profiles and just different things. And, and I would be, uh, really want to encourage you, to, if you'd like to, to, to send us a message. Let us know how you're doing at this time and if there's any way we can help you with anything. So as I've said, the Bible clearly indicates that we can be filled with God's presence with his Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that we are full of him. That doesn't mean that we are bearing his likeness. It's a, it's a process, isn't it, um, to become more like Jesus, to allow him and his spirit to, to, to uh, transform our thinking, to transform our minds. And uh, as he dwells with, within us to kind of change our hearts so that we end up becoming more like him, reacting more like him, seeing things from his perspective more. And um, so before George comes to lead us in a time of worship, and Paul Clarenbold is actually going to bring us God's word today, I want to pose a question that I think I, I certainly need to ask myself regularly. And um, it kind of is an indicator of how well we're doing um, in the transformation of our lives into the image of Christ. And, and the question is this, when people see you or listen to you or encounter you, dare I say when they read stuff that you're posting on social media um, or they see how you're acting, what do they see? Are they truly seeing something of God? Are they encountering Jesus um, as you speak and as you conduct your lives, are they being touched by the Holy Spirit flowing through you and from you? Are they getting a good representation of God or are they getting something different? A tough question to answer. There's a lot going on in the world at the moment. I, like you, I'm sure, have been horrified and deeply, deeply grieved by many things I've seen and heard and read about over these weeks. There is certainly immense pain and anger there's grave inequality and discrimination and much judgment flying around in every direction. There's many voices that are airing many opinions, some wholesome and good, some awful, some godly, some very ungodly, uh, some helpful, and sadly, I fear, 
uh, some both unhelpful and unwise. The Bible talks in a lot of occasions about testing ourselves and in 2 Corinthians, Paul in chapter 13 again says that we should examine ourselves to see if, if our faith is really genuine, to test ourselves. Um, and it goes on to say, if you cannot tell that Jesus is among you, it means you failed the test. Uh, the amplified version of the Bible says it a bit differently. It says, examine and test and evaluate your own selves to see whether you are holding to your faith and showing the proper fruit of it. Test and approve yourselves. So as we come into a time of worship, as we come into God's presence, I want to suggest that we truthfully ask him to search us, that we give him permission to challenge and to mould us for his glory. Paul ends his letter at the place where I would like to start our worship time, really, um, by pronouncing a blessing. And, And so wherever you are physically right now, I want to say, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit truly be with you all. God bless you. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me Oh, I'm gonna sing In the middle of a storm
There's a battle raging over this land A deep damage in the people The pride stops us stretching out our withered hand But God has stretched out to heal us This I know This I know this I know, this I know, just one touch from the King changes everything, just one touch from the King changes everything, changes Everything. There's a great darkness over this land, a deep darkness on the people. The light is shining that the dark can't understand. The light of the world can't change. Is 
can do. 
Yes, you. It's 
church and this is really great to be uh, with you even though it's a, a bit of a distance um, for those of you that don't know my name is Paul and um, generally I, I minister and, and uh, uh, do bits and pieces in, in Poland in northern Poland but because of the circumstances I'm back here in the UK at the moment but, um, for those of you that have been uh, asking about how it's going God has been doing amazing things and uh, please do come and ask at some point and I'll be able to give you more of the details. But to this morning, um, God has uh, been showing me some, uh, some things over uh, a, a course of time and um, I don't know if you've realized but uh, in, in scripture we see that when Jesus wanted to get across a particular point, 
he would often use the surrounding circumstances to, to make that clear, mainly because the audience that he was referring to uh, would know about those things. So for the disciples, some of them were fishermen. And uh, so he would say to, to some of the disciples on, on one occasion, you know, I will make you fishers of men, relaying what they knew to the coming kingdom life that they would soon be experiencing. And we see this in other ways too. He talked about farming illustrations and about being the good shepherd and so on and so on. So I'm saying that to you this morning because I'm going to use more of a modern day illustration as, as we share today uh, as part of the, the traveling that I do. And um, that uh, comes about really because I do have to fly a lot into into Poland. And so it's part of my life in a way. Uh, and I see lots of things happening and experience lots of different things. So I hope you'll run with me as we combine God's word with this modern day experience of life. But first of all, let's, let's turn into the scriptures. And um, I want us to read from uh, Philippians 3. And this is a familiar passage to many, but let's just read it from verse 7. It says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted as lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I, I do not count myself to have apprehended this, but one thing I do, forgetting those things are, which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And then just quickly into Psalm uh, 123, not Psalm 23, but 123. It says this, Unto you I lift my eyes. O you who dwell in the heavens, behold as the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of, their, of her mistress, so our eyes to the Lord our God until his mercy has come upon us. If I was to give this morning a title, it would simply be this, staying the course, staying the course. And I referenced just a few moments ago that I was going to use a modern, illust Ill date, modern day illustration uh, to discuss that, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about some aspects of flying. And um, I guess if Jesus was with me on these trips, he would probably be pointing out things through the very same thing. But I don't know if you're aware, but, um, you know, we just jump on a plane and we travel. And uh, it's not quite as straightforward as that. There's a lot more work, of course, that goes into any flight. And one of the things that I'm told is that the, the pilots have to deal with what they call variables. And these variables come in different shapes and forms, one of which actually is, is of course, is the weather. And uh, some of the time the weather is just beautiful, the sky is blue, there's very little um, uh, wind or uh, bad weather uh, circumstances, and so the flight is easier. But what happens on those journeys where you get strong winds? And um, I'm informed that one of the things that they have to do is they have to calculate the fact that these winds, if they come from the side, could actually push the plane off course. And so what happens is, is that they set their coordinates for their destination. 
And so effectively, even if the wind is coming from one side and knocking against the side of the plane, which most passengers are totally unaware of, unless of course you get up and down turbulence, but, but their course is set. So the nose is pointing always to where they're trying to go. So as the wind comes, so the plane remains pointing in the right direction. And um, I felt God really say to me over time, Paul, this is how you have got to be in what I'm calling you to do. You need to stay focused. And um, uh, it was about 2012. Uh, some of you will know that God called me to uh, get very involved in the work in, in Poland and the ministry there. And one of the things that God said to me at the time was, Paul, I want you to, to be as a father to people. And I found that quite daunting, if I'm honest. Um, I am a biological father, and that's great. But to, to consider that people would be looking at me and perhaps wanting to gain spiritual experience, that's quite a task to make sure that you're living accordingly. But God put various uh, ways or, or allowing me to do this in various ways, one of which was teaching, another was preaching, uh, another was just one-to-one -one sharing with people through the course of the, uh, the people that I meet with. And then finally, uh, the, the leading by example, the one where people are watching what you are doing. So there's no pressure, but, but nevertheless, and, and actually that's a call in many ways for, for most of us. But um, over the years, um, Anne and I, uh, when Anne has been able to be with me, we've traveled and uh, we now currently teach in two Bible schools. And there are various um, churches that we're, we're connected to. And, um, and so we've had the privilege of, of being able to share and do those things and to father. But just occasionally, some things come across to us. And it's as though that strong side wind wants to push us off course. And it may be people's opinions or a different cultural aspect. And you have to know the right from the wrong. Now, I do just need to say that, um, you know, I, I, I operate from this church and I'm very blessed to operate from this church. I've been a member here now for over 40 years. I know some of you probably think, how can that be? He doesn't look that old, but it's true. Um, but I'm not a free spirit. In other words, I don't just go and do what I, I want. I'm hopefully listening to God. Uh, but I'm also responsible to a team of people who would come alongside me, ask me how it's going, challenge me if necessary, bring prophetic words. And so it's a team response. But equally, there have been times when I've needed to call out to some of those people and say, hey, this is happening or that's happening. What would you do? And um, I've, I've had to really stand firm at times and to uh, not to be belligerent, but to try and stay focused. Um, this, does, this doesn't mean that I can't be interested in other things. Of course, there are always things that stir our hearts and... Um, Sometimes we can be involved with them directly. Other times we can give financially or whatever. But, but for me, I have know God said to me, Paul, listen to what I'm saying and have the courage to go and do that. And as I've looked in scripture, I've, I've come across people that, that had those variables, the crosswinds of life come against them. I've just been reading through the book of Genesis. And um, in fact, I've gone through it twice. And uh, I've, I've been... Um, amazed, particularly uh, the story of Joseph stands out for me very much. And um, what I find fascinating about Joseph is that he, he seems to be this young man who starts out with what were just two dreams and life comes against him and he doesn't seem to buckle. I'm sure he must have had his days where he was thinking, God, what on earth is going on? But here is a man who is clearly despised by his brothers. They wanted to kill him. As a result of that, he gets sold into slavery. And from that point of slavery, something then happens that gets him put into prison. 
and he constantly feels the buffeting of those crosswinds in his life. He doesn't know the end of the story. All he's got is these two dreams. We can now read it and be blessed uh, because we know where this all went to and the, and the brilliant answer and the way that God performed the things in Joseph's lives. But, you know, there are two points in the story with Joseph that really stand out that tell me that his coordinates were very clear. And we read in, in Genesis, uh, Genesis 39, we read this. This is at a time when he's, he's in his master's house, now as a slave in Egypt, and the master's wife uh, starts to um, take interest in him, and she desires him. He's a, scripture says that he's a, um, um, a, a very handsome-looking man. But in verse uh, 9 of, of Genesis 39, it says this. It's that Joseph is saying to this woman, look, there's no one greater in this house than I, nor has he, my master, kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although he's in this dilemma, he's away from home, he's been sold into slavery, Joseph keeps his coordinates, his bearings firmly on God. He recognizes that he can't go there. You know, I, I guess if this was other people, maybe for myself, I don't know. I don't know what, how I would respond, hopefully faithfully. But life's been not very good. And just for those few minutes, the temptation to think, do you know what? Nobody seems to care. I'm stuck here in Egypt. What will it matter? But no, his focus is on what God would have him do. As a result of this situation, um, things go from bad to worse. He then gets thrown into prison because the master's wife accuses Joseph of uh, misconduct. And so he, the master has no choice. You've got to go to prison until we can sort this out. And um, a period of time happens. We're not quite sure how long that is, but he's in prison. And as time goes on, again, what we see is that because he's an honorable man, God is blessing Joseph and he gets given responsibility in the prison. And over the course of time, two gentlemen from the Pharaoh's court join the prison. They've clearly done something wrong and, um, and Joseph gets to talk to them. And one day he sees that their countenance, their face is very down and is very sad. And, and we pick up the story again in, in, in Genesis 40 where it says this, um, he says to them, why are you so sad? And, and in verse 8, and they say to him, we each have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it for us. And this is the point. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me, please, and I will try to help you. And again, here's Joseph. He could have said, oh, well, tough luck. You know, you got yourself into this mess. Don't come bothering me. But no. He's referring to his God, holding his position. And as a result of that, he, uh, he, he interprets the dream. It's good news for one of the guys, not so good news for the other one, but the dreams are accurate. And so he then says to them, you know, look, remember me when uh, you get out of here to the guy that gets released and it's good news for, remember me. But sadly, Another two years go, goes by and Joseph is forgotten. But all the time he keeps going until the day that he finds that, that he can help Pharaoh, the man, the leader himself. And he's brought out of the prison. And we see the fulfillment of the years. His coordinates bring him right to the very place where God intended him to be, which was actually to have a, a senior position in Egypt, help him for what was a coming famine, which would affect not only Egypt, but the surrounding nations. And I think to myself, wow, Joseph, good for you. About 13 years he had to endure this constant onslaught, but he kept his focus. And, you know, we can, we can go through many of people in Scripture. Jeremiah was another one, called as a young prophet, but constantly 
harassed constantly. Actually, he did complain, but he stayed the course. I read about Ezekiel, uh, a specific calling to the house of God, where God says to him, I'm sending you to the children of Israel. Now, Ezekiel was an Israelite, but they were now in exile, and his job was to go and encourage them and to bring the word. But here comes the, the crosswind. When God speaks to him about his calling, he says, I'm sending you to a, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they've been impudent and stubborn children, and I'm sending you to them. Can you imagine Ezekiel? He thinks, well, I'm already in exile, and now you want me to, to deal with this, this rebellious people. I can't help but wonder if, if he must have thought to himself, could I not have had a beach mission somewhere or some other calling? But you want me now to try and bring your word to them, this rebellious people. But he does it. He stays the course. And then we come into to the New Testament and we read about um, uh, Jesus with the disciples in Matthew 16. An interesting time. And this is the, the point at which Jesus has been saying to his disciples, who do the people say I am? And they all come up with their answer until Peter jumps up and says, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus applauds him and says, yeah, well done. Well done, Peter. You've got it exactly right. And do you know that came to you from God? So Peter's feeling very strong about this. And then it goes on in from verse 21 of, of Matthew 16. And let's pick up the scripture there. For it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Now, that is an understatement. That was a sizable crosswind. But it says he must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and to be killed and to be raised on the third day. Peter then takes him aside and began rebuking him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Wow. Can you imagine? Peter went from up here to right down here. And um, we don't know how the, the, what sort of time frame there was between those two portions of Scripture, but not very long. But here we, we see Jesus who knows he is going to his death. He's going to face the strongest variable, crosswind, if you like, possible to man. And he would not be deterred from the course. In fact, we read there in Luke 9, verse 51. It says this, and now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that Jesus steadily set his face to go to Jerusalem. Steadily set his face. There was no panic. There was just this assurance. This is the path I have to take, and this is the way I need to go. Wow. He knew where he was heading. The coordinates were set from in heaven. And now he's not going to let anybody persuade him. I think if that had been me, again, I probably would have thought, Peter, what a great idea. Let's go somewhere else. No, that's not how it was. And then finally, I move on to, to the Apostle Paul. Again, a, a great man of God. And you can see why he wrote in Philippians there, where he says there that, that he is reaching forward uh, to those things which are ahead, that he's pressing for the goal, for the prize of the upward call in God. He's seen his destination. He knows that eternity will be calling him, and it's not going to persuade him. But in the book of Acts, we read this, 21. It's, it's a time when they they had been, uh, they, they were traveling on one of the missionary journeys, and they came to a particular place, and then um, very quickly moved on to another place. They were constantly on the move. But they came to Caesarea. 
it tells us, and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. And uh, it says this man had four daughters who prophesied. And verse 10, this is where things get a little bit more interesting. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those that were from the place pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, but we said this, the Lord, the will of the Lord be done. Paul has given a prophetic word. And again, most of us probably would have responded by thinking, oh, I better avoid Jerusalem at all costs. But Paul didn't see this as a problem. He saw this as part of the course that he was taking. He was embracing it, not discarding it. And that is, that's an amazing quality of a man. But what I'm coming to, friends, is this, is that God will call us to do things. He will set paths and journeys before us. Some of those will be simple. Some of those may be more challenging. Some of them may be close to home, maybe just to be faithful in the workplace. Or God may call you further afield. But whatever, he will expect us to stay close to the course. It was back in uh, 2015 um, that I actually had course to travel to the south of Poland at the time. And um, forgive me if I've, I've told this story before, uh, but God had already been challenging me that, um, that I'd made the decision to go to the south. It was a very practical thing, actually. I had some, a few days on my, uh, on my hands free and I wanted just to help an individual who was moving their uh, materials back to home to the south and so I said I'll do it and I felt God challenged me and said Paul but you didn't ask me and I, so I came before God and I apologized I was sorry for what I did but God actually said it's okay your deed is good go but I want you to remember who is setting your course but it was during this time that while I was in the south that I also met a, a pastor of a very small church. And um, we got on very well. A nice guy, full of passion, full of desire, clear vision of God. But um, one day, um, he uh, just uh, on one of the days I was there, he, he, he said to me, Paul, he said, this is interesting that you've come. He said, because I had a prophecy given me some uh, while ago that somebody from England would come and help me in my work here. And he's looking at me, and I know what he was thinking. He's saying, Paul, I think that man is you. So I'm thinking, well, I can't despise prophecy, but it does tell us to test it. So I, I said to him, well, okay, let's just pray about this and think about it, because I'm up in the north, and this is very much in the south. How are the two going to meet? And over a course of time, I, I prayed, and everything I seemed to pray or look into you. I just felt God was not there in this project. And it was some time later that uh, eventually I, I um, haven't thought about maybe it was just I could help him financially, but somebody came to me um, with a prophecy from this church, a man that I trust implicitly with pro uh, prophetic words. And he said, Paul, I had this picture the other day and I need to share it with you. He said, but you were on a road and you stopped and you climbed over a wall and you were heading towards this house. And he described this house. And I'm gobsmacked because the house he was describing to the color of the windows and the doors was this pastor's house. And what he was saying to me, Paul, you've come off the road. You've gone over a wall. You shouldn't be there. And God in his grace and his mercy was trying to say to me, Paul, you've taken your course. You've changed the coordinates. Don't get involved. Now, there was nothing wrong with this guy. 
as far as I'm aware, he's still going. He's, he's doing a great job. But it wasn't for me. And it was a real lesson for me to learn at that particular time. You know, whatever we're called to, God is looking for faithfulness. And that faithfulness can be difficult at times. And it can be sacrificial. It can be hard. But God will be looking to us to say, will you complete the course? Two other illustrations, and I'm going to be very quick with these, about the flying thing. I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, whenever you fly somewhere, you don't fly in a straight line. And you might think, well, that's crazy. Of course you do. You take off, you go up, you come down. But no, it's not like that. And if you've um, ever watched somebody on one of these flight tracker systems, you will see it's very accurate that the path the plane takes, it's going to a destination, yes, but it goes up, moves one way, then it might turn, come back across this way. And I understand these are called flight paths. And uh, you may now think, well, Paul, you're, you're about to be contradictory, having just said what you said. But I need to say this also, is that sometimes God, although he's got you on a destination, will take you and put you on a new flight path. It's still aiming to where you're going, but he's changing where you need to be for a period of time. And there are all sorts of reasons why they do that. But basically, I guess it's just like modern day traffic. You don't want planes colliding in the air. They have to move within certain line structures. But again, some years ago, um, in the early days of the work in Poland, I was very involved with a, a church and a pastor. Um, and it was great. Um, we got on very well. And I felt very involved with the life of this church, able to share many key things. But then something started to change. And um, I found that as in our relationship together that we were disagreeing over some things. And um, I found this a bit difficult, thinking, what's going on? Promises were made but not kept. And eventually I began to realize that actually there was nothing wrong with the circumstances. It was the fact that God was saying to me, Paul, I've got a, a new path for you to go on. And by me pulling away from that particular church at that time, it brought me into a new area of teaching, uh, again, back in the north of Poland, that has been a, a mainstay for me, for, uh, for Anne and I, for many years, and um, something which we thoroughly enjoyed. But I want to say this to you, friends, that the path is not so rigid that there is nothing else. You know, God will often take you on the journey, and then he, will, he might lead you into a fresh job, because that's part of the training, the experience. And then he might take you across here to do something else. Be flexible. Be listening. You're still on the journey. You're still being faithful. But be listening to God for the change. And then finally, just to say this, is that, um, you know, any flight that takes place, it's subject to what actually the pilots are told. Everybody gives the pilots the great credit and, a, and an amazing job they do. Don't get me wrong. But they're listening to instructions. There have been times when um, I've been down at Stansted and I've been on the plane waiting to go. And then the pilot will come across because you're sitting there thinking nothing's happening. And you'll say, you know, words to the effect, you know, we've, we've lost our time slot. So we've got to wait. And somebody uh, in another area, maybe that's France or Germany, will give us instructions and say, we're now free to go. There is communication going on between the parlor and the place to where he's going. And I feel it's important to, to remind us this morning, you need to be in that communication with God. It tells us that Jesus, um, of Jesus it says this in John 5, verse 18. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill Jesus. There was another crosswind because he not only broke the Sabbath, Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son of man can do nothing of himself, but what? he sees the father doing 
For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does and will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. The key to Jesus' success, I believe, was that, was that he went and spent time with his Father. He had a destination. We know what that was. That was to come and die for mankind, to die a terrible death on the cross, but he was not going to be pushed by any variables. He did during that time of ministry, the three, three and a half years when he built his disciples up, disciples up ready for their time when they would take on and lead the church. What he did was that he said to them, you've got to do what I tell you to do. It's that important. And the only way to do that was to spend time. And I want to say to your friends that, you know, it's your success in whatever God calls you to do is actually is down to that. Every flight gives me assurance that it's not just the pilot that's doing what he wants. He's listening to somebody somewhere, maybe down on the ground, telling him, you need to do this. You need to turn this way. I want you to keep going on ahead. Make, maintain your height raise your height, bring your height down. And there's this constant movement. You don't see that when you're on the plane. You don't even, you're not even aware of it, but there's lots of activity, I'm sure. But those three things I really felt God say were important for us today. Coming back to that Psalm 123. Unto you I lift my eyes. O you who would dwell in the heavens, behold, as the eyes of the servant look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to you, our God. Keep looking to him. Make sure you're on the right path. If he tells you to make a change, make the change. But do it because he says so. You know, I'm aware that some of you will be saying, well, you know, I'm not being called to ministry abroad or whatever, but you are called to ministry whether that's in your workplace, in your colleges, wherever God has called you to be. And I know there are some restrictions. You, there are some places that are not so easy. It's not so easy to mention the name of Jesus, but you can still be light. You can still behave accordingly. Your love and your kindness are still important. But whatever God is saying to you, I want to say do it with all of your heart, but get the coordinates. Make sure you're going in the right direction changing when he says so, listening to him. Friends, I hope that's been a blessing today in some way. It's been a journey that I've undertaken uh, over a period of time. Have I arrived? No. And I guess when I get on the next plane, whenever that will be, nobody knows uh, at the moment, but it may come soon. I will be mindful of the fact that God is telling me the same things and maybe fresh things. And he wants to do that for you too. God bless you. Amen. King of love and grace, my God, all my hopes and fears are in your hands. I Where you go, I'll go, show me the way. Every step I take, be now my God. God on my side. You go before me. You're there beside. Trust and obey, 
Let your kingdom come, your will be done. All your promises will stand forever. You're my defender. You go before me. You're there beside me. And if I want. God, our great defender, strong in love, forever faithful. We are yours and we will trust in you. Oh, and you are God, our great defender, strong in love, forever. Stop. 